this is a composite presentation by uh, two persons for this particular reason. So let me, state, uh, let me start by stating the obvious, since I've been the teacher for the whole of my professional life, so I'm stating the obvious to start with. Uh, we are talking about archaeological collections. Very broadly speaking, archaeological collections in general are treated by, observed by, perceived by, something is done to them by two groups of, well, two groups of individuals, two groups with different starting positions. One is professionals, which is us, and second is the public. We should bear in mind that somehow what we do with the collections eventually ends up in one way or another, in one form or another, in some public domain. So there is definitely some kind of relationship between professionals dealing with the collections and non-professionals or the wider public also wanting to know something Otherwise, we would be completely redundant. If the public, the people not being professionals, were not interested in what we are doing, then what the hell? So, those professionals are, in fact, uh, offering or are supposed to offer some kind of interpretation of these uh, archaeological collections for the public. So, again, uh, there are two ways of doing it. First of all, by presentation, which is quite conventionally thought of as a museum practice. So there are people, professionals, doing interpretation in order to present things in the museums. On the other hand, there is research, of course. And research is somehow seen as a thing located very, very firmly in academia. So we have people doing in museums, people presenting things in museums, and on the other hand, people researching and doing some kind of academic, very serious work. And for one reason or another, especially in the, the, uh, judging by the experience from my own academic community, from my own professional community in the country I come from, these two groups of professionals don't communicate quite well. And that's one of the reasons that Tatiana, who is a museum expert, and myself, who come from academia, decided trying to do things together and to try thinking over this bridge inside the professional community dealing with collections. So what we are going to talk today is more or less one of our efforts, one of our attempts, to try and bridge the gap inside the professional community dealing with collections. So we, in fact, uh, have the same professional training, but for, mm, for the best part of our professional lives, we have different experiences, different aims, and more or less different priorities. And it bears quite a lot of very severe, uh, severe problems for our profession. So to start from my point of view, yeah. Somebody had to be first. <laughs> Not the professor. Uh, let us, for the sake of argument, imagine that there is some definite thing called the past. And that definite thing called the past, of course, is a kind of a construct. But for the sake of the argument, as I said, let's start there. And I'm, now I'm building very hardly on the things done by uh, Kevin Lucas uh, and his talk about total record. So one part of this, the past, is then being preserved because of all kinds of physical and other uh, agencies. Yet smaller part of it is being retrieved by archaeologists. Even smaller part of it is being studied by archaeologists. And finally, we are shrinking to the part which is presented. And in each and every cycle of selection, there are some intentional and unintentional criteria that are being employed in order to shrink these cycles. So what we get in the end is a very small part percentage of the whole possible potential <coughs> past that we might be collecting, studying, and presenting. So from the point of view of an academic archaeologist doing research, that's how things are <coughs> for me. And now a slightly different view is going to be presented by time. Oh, sorry. It's not. So now we are moving to the real world museums. And we do have there something that is archaeological record that our colleagues are sometimes nice, sometimes not nice to give us, while they are giving us quite a lot of material. It is great when the material is coming uh, to the museum and it could be acquired in completely different ways. One is research done by a museum or by other institution 
and then happily we do have all the data we need to explain that record and they could come as well as gifts or donation or purchases and probably most of the time with not really accurate and really true data that we have. So we are insisting on the context, we are then processing material, making that selection even smaller, uh, doing first our favorite description, and then we are categorizing things into something called the collection and something called study collection, giving already that some kind of selection. And then we are valorizing those objects, first of all, in the terms, in my country, it is, is it really normal cultural heritage or is it extraordinary? But basically, we are valorizing objects in the terms of could they be exhibited? So do they possess quality to be in some kind of presentation? And then we are exhibiting them, giving tiny little part, again, of the whole collection we have. And you know that usual numbers for museums are the most is 10 percent and I think that people are usually lying about that because it's not. And then finally you have some kind of mediation. So in that process you have several selections going again, several cycles, but in this case uh, one very important moment is really moment of categorizing because that is the moment that objects are transforming into heritage and they are now written in the records as something that is recognized in heritage, and the moment of exhibition when they are losing the context we really wanted in the first place. We don't really care in a museum about context because you're never ever going to reconstruct the context that someone else destroyed. And then uh, we are doing it by the criteria that I really connected with the training but basically personal, even if there is a poli policy of acquirement, the, the acquisition we are doing it personally, we are doing that very intentionally, and uh, we are not objective at all, so we are not neutral. So every our decision about what to keep, how to divide, what to collect, what to exhibit, or more importantly, what not, is really very subjective and very political and connected with different aims, objectives and everything, even if we have same training. And we wanted to, we wanted to show you really on the example of the collection of the National Museum, how those selected representation of the past finally look. So for the National Museum in Belgrade, which is the central institution of Serbia, museum institution, ancient Greece in, in, is in focus from the 1930s. We then gained the beautiful building, which was previously meant to be a court building, and it was under the name of the Museum of Prince Paul, and a huge part of it was a Greek collection, then represented in that museum with the idea to show really European origin of our culture and connections with European ideas. Then, in a new building, the 1950s, when we got the new building, which was previously a bank, uh, <coughs> Central Greece was even physically in focus because it's the atrium type building, which continued until 98. And again, Greece being in focus. But, do we really have Greek sites in Serbia? We don't. All the material is coming from the excavations National Museum done in Montenegro and in Macedonia. Finally, in one point of time, we got our own Greek site, uh, which is the, how do they say, most northern site with Greek material and most southern site with Celtic material. And we were so happy. It is called Kalikoshitsa, and it is a beautiful and very important site. 
And we were so thrilled, and the excavations were done by Archaeological Institute and by National Museum and the museum in uh, In the small town, right? We made a couple of exhibitions showing them not just in Belgrade, but in other cities in Serbia and as well as in Slovenia in one moment of time, finishing with great big exhibition with a strange message that you are going to hear more about after us. <coughs> but after that great big exhibition that took like 80% of our exhibition space, Kale Kršenica was now, is now, in our new display, just one showcase. So, did we shrink the importance of, of Kale Kršenica or what is going on with that? So, the site is still relevant, the site is really very important, but as we want to show, and we are basically showing in our permanent displays, those prestigious windows of power and progress and idea of, of the, how old the nation is and how beautiful things are, uh, we were creating kind of very false past in history and expecting, and that is happening, the public to bow to our authority. And what I'm asking and what is happening is how our collections are really mediating past in this way. <coughs> what tiny little part of the past we are doing. This collection is now, uh, this Kali Krševice is now in inventory of the National Museum Belgrade, Greek and Hellenistic collection, but that's not the only thing that we have. We have some other important things that... So among the collections in the National Museum, among the, the objects held in the National Museum of Belgrade, are things from the princely graves. And I won't dwell upon princely graves, it's another issue. But that was a particular uh, focus of my research as a, as a researcher. And I was doing stuff such as this thing, which is from Novi Pazar, and also another thing held in, Novi, in the Museum of Belgrade, which is material from Trebenište. So I simply took out of the collection, of the Greek collection in the National Museum, the pieces I wanted to take care of, to think about, to study. So I simply fragmented again not only myself, that's what we do. I took out of the collection the pieces I wanted to study. So they are together, they are physically stored together. Does that make them a collection? Or perhaps collecting and collating through research, I was making another collection. I was in fact devising, constructing another collection by joining these artifacts with Another simple set of, uh, simple, sorry, similar set of artifacts, which was found in another museum. So I was, in fact, joining the material from the National Museum of Belgrade with the museum in Sofia, with the museum in Sarajevo, collating, in fact, all kinds of different material, different collections, different physical collections, different. Uh, museum collections into my own assemblage for the sake of my own research. I was merging collections in order to back up my authority of researcher. So, in fact, the collection may be what is collected in physical sense, but also a collection that we are making through research sometimes doesn't overlap <coughs> neatly with what's being stored together. We are, in fact, inventing collections all over again. Now, back to time. Yeah. So. So, as you saw, uh, the first slide uh, with Trebenište, and uh, this is actually one site divided in three, re um, three states. Three states? Yeah. yeah, so we have on one side that authority of the curator, and we have collections. So, what were our question about the different cycles of selection and election? Because I really do think. And we both think that, that our authority is really creating what do we think it's heritage and archaeological material. So are the collections things that are sorted and packed or just partly revealed because the public can't see everything? 
And when we are thinking about that, uh, you have to really be aware that we are talking, we were talking today quite a lot about history of what's happening in about 19th century and 20th century. But what we are doing now is the same thing. So we have also really interesting histories of collections happening right now. And you have really to be aware what we are doing, both of us, what, what researchers are doing with giving us material, what uh, our archaeology curators are doing, showing material. And uh, we are so proud, museums are really proud that we have that, all that evidence, thinking it is real, it is really showing something. But with that kind of selection, my question is really, oh, sorry, that's not my question. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. Is this selection, <coughs> when you not neatly pack your material and put it in a storage, what kind of selection is that and what kind of accessibility we do really have? And we have to think about that because really what we are doing now and what kind of selection we are making and what kind of connections we are making is really creating archaeological heritage for the future. And we do have to think about practices and we have to think about new policies and we have to think about better cooperation in between two of us. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah.